Okay. All right. Yeah. Next up is one of our regulars, Maček. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did you walk from Skadarlia today? Yeah, 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 I did. Yeah, of course you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to walk this evening and tomorrow morning and tomorrow evening and yeah, whatnot. He just loves this city. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. you, guys. I love the place. Maček. Okay, so I'm really happy to be here. Uh, but still, where are my slides? Okay, so, oh yeah, here they are. So I'm really happy to be here after three years. Uh, yeah, this is really cool. I've been in Belgrade, I think, on all the hipcons and Vox Belgrades and, and so on. But this talk is not about me. Although, uh, probably I should mention that I work in Tok, we're based in Warsaw. It's not, not also not about the project I'm working on for quite a few years, but check it out, it's called Nusknacker, and it's a tool, cool tool for lowering the barrier between the developers and subject matter experts. And today we'll be talking about time, so it's good that we started on time. But we also won't be talking about things like this, about instance, time zones, various Java methods or for parsing, printing dates, time zones, daylight saving, and so on. Why? Because they are too difficult for me. After all those years, I think uh, I'm still too stupid to, to do uh, most of them. But it's also the case for, for many other people. For example, when I prepared this talk, there's a major incident and on one of the largest Polish railway stations. So the trains didn't come and go for quite a few hours. And it turned out it was, there was some kind of back end steering software uh, connected with formatting time. And when I read the, uh, the press communicate, the, it says like time formatting errors are known phenomena. This is not a bug, it's phenomena, just like earthquakes, hurricanes and so on. So we won't be doing anything with that. Uh, we'll be focusing on something much more simple. From now on, uh, the only time zone is milliseconds of Unix era. So in fact, I don't think we should be calling to, like now it's 10, 20 South uh, Central Europe European time. We should be saying like, it's more or less like 1 trillion, 667 billion, 470 and so on, so on milliseconds of era. So repeat after me and synchronize your clocks uh, accordingly. So how do you get this number? Of course, you can get it from internet or probably from a soft, uh, smartwatch, but if you are coding, for example, in Java, you do it by such a nice old static method like system current time mills. So I've used it for like, I don't know, probably 17, 80 years, but at some point I started to wonder, so, what does this method really do? Of course, if you look at the source code, you'll see it's native Java method, so nothing to, <laughs> to learn from that. But probably there is some clock on your computer. And if you put an ear in here, you could probably hear some zzzz. So there's a clock. It's ticking pretty fast because it's not one second, but one millisecond. Probably it looks more or less like this, not like this, this one. And in fact, you can interact with, with it with some Linux uh, tools. You can connect it via some dev RTC, um, RTC socket. And you can get quite a lot of information how your system, mm, how, uh, how, how your hardware uh, clock really works. So there's a piece of, mm, uh, there's a piece of hardware or your motherboard probably. But if you think about it, you have also have a piece of hardware on your motherboard, and it's called processor. And there's the frequency, there's the oscillator, and there is also some kind of counter that ticks at specified frequency. So why don't you use it to measure time? And it turns out that this is really, a, well, it goes like this, right? You can use mm, the, the register and counters on, on the processor to on your course to, to calculate the time. And you, if you go to appropriate, as usually at Linux or Unix, uh, to usual file fit sys devices, you can see that there's a thing like available clock sources. And one of them is TST. This is timestamp counter from, uh, from your course. And there are quite a few other different uh, means of measuring time, which are more connected with various pieces of hardware at your motherboard. Why am I saying this? Because this 
uh, this is the place where things start to get tricky. Because back in the old days, uh, there was one core. It was ticking at specified frequency. But now probably you have two or four of them. I have eight, uh, as I have AMD Ryzen at my laptop. And they tick with specified frequency or not, because you have various uh, turbo modes, various pow power saving modes, so the frequency of the core it can change during time. And then you have many cores. You have to synchronize them so the, the, the passage of time is uniform for all of your computer. And it turns out that you know, those things should be sorted out, but I, figured, but I managed to find that it's not always like this. And sometimes when the system boots, it tries to synchronize various counters. And sometimes it turns out that, no, they can't synchronize. For example, I had some problems with my Lenovo laptop. And then the system just falls back to, to the older, uh, more hardware-based, somewhere on your motherboard methods of, uh, of, uh, of checking time. It's called HPAT. And why am I saying this? Probably you would expect that this is somewhere back, back in the kernel, and you wouldn't find out how it really works. But I found out during some micro benchmarking that surprisingly half you can see it in the flame graph that half of the time of my benchmark actually was spent on reading the time by by some you know so, some system methods for for measuring time and this is because my Lenovo laptop was had some hardware problems and after I fixed that by of course by restarting the thing <laughs> you can see that there's more efficient method of, of uh, time computations. And here, all the parts for, uh, that, that was spent uh, getting the, the exact amount of time was more or less here. It's more, more or less not visible. So measuring system milliseconds is not so obvious as we may see. And of course, if you are in a cloud setting, there are other problems because you don't have access to and direct access to the course, to the counter. There's virtualization. And then there's, again, some KVM clock. But I would assume that the guys who are writing this know what they're doing. Probably they are. So this, is, this should be more or less all problems solved. But if you think about it, like one millisecond in, in, today, in today's systems, this can be quite a lot. Probably you may want to have lower latency than millisecond. You want to measure times uh, in, 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 in lower resolution, in higher resolutions. So, and for example, in Java, you have another system method, static, that is system nanotime, right? So, when I was younger and I discovered that method, I would assume that, okay, this is the, uh, this is the relation of nanotime to current time millis, right? So the current time millis is like nanotime divided by one million. What can go wrong, right? And, but if you, again, look at the source code, you'll see that it's not, it's not so easy, that the implementations of those methods are pretty, pretty dif different. So why is that? Well, we, I won't have many laws in my, uh, in, in today's talk, but one of them is this. A man with a watch knows what time is it. A man with two watches is never sure. And it turns out that we do have quite a lot of watches or clocks in our system. I don't know who was Segal's, probably nothing relevant, probably not connected to computers, but still, I think it was based on the watches, uh, but it was based on the idea that uh, people in jewelry wanted people to have watches on both hands and so on. So. But, Anyway, what happens if we change the date? Right, we can do it. Probably you need maybe some root access to that and so on. But what happens to all the programs to their notion of time when the time passes? And it turns out that in Linux, you have quite a few uh, ways of measuring time of uh, quite a few clocks. Yeah, that should be. But, but still, there are quite a few of them. One is clock real time. This is what is uh, written by current time list. The other, and this can be affected by, uh, by you setting the dates of, on your clock uh, from the, uh, on your computer. The other one is clock monotonic. 
and this is returned by system nanotime, and it's a different operating system clock that, as the name says, is monotonic, right? You cannot uh, adjust it so it goes backwards. So they can be related, but this one can be adjusted by the user, while this one not. And there are quite a few others that we will, won't talk about too much uh, today. So what happens if you write a code like this in Java? So we have thread sleep, 60 seconds. Well, probably this, you wouldn't want to, to write this stuff because you are clean coders. You, you know that thread sleep should be avoided. So in more reactive settings, you'll do like this. You have some schedule, you have schedule. Do something after 10 seconds. So which clock is used for either this or that? And it turns out that uh, currently, of course, it's fixed, and we know uh, what, is, uh, what is used, but it took Java quite a few years to figure out that. It was up till version 6 of Java, uh, and before, uh, the thread sleep and uh, methods like that was, uh, could be... Uh, could be influenced by changes to, to the operating system clock, right? So this method could wait, for example, not 60, uh, 60 seconds, but one hour and 60 seconds if you adjust the system clock. So it may seem uh, easy, right? We have uh, thread sleep or various schedulers that should just use monotonic clock as they do uh, currently. But if you think more about it, we can have more complex, uh, more complex mm, cases. Like, for example, you read some date, like, I don't know, 3rd of November, uh, 12 hour and so on, and you say, I want to wait until that time. So you can do it in pseudo, oh, maybe not pseudocode, in the code like this. You read the argument, you compute the, uh, the milliseconds of mm, Unix time, and you subtract the, the current time millis. And you wait for such a long time. Of course, you have reactive code, so probably you would write it in any way. But this uses, uh, this uses monotonic time. And what happens is that in this case, maybe we don't want to use monotonic time because we want to wait until certain wall clock time, right? We don't care if it's 60 seconds or 120 seconds. If it turns out that our clock should be adjusted, then the slip method should also be adjusted. So it's not so, it's not so obvious which clock should be used. And in fact, it, yeah, this is the question that, that is not so easy to, to answer. And also, well-established open source project like Zookeeper also had quite a few problems with that. Uh, this one is a bug from Zookeeper. It's like 3.5.1, uh, so it was fixed, I don't know, like two or three years only two or three years ago, and it says that before that uh, you can wreak havoc on your Zookeeper cluster if you uh, just switch, switch the hour. So in fact their code was so inter intertangled that they had to introduce their own abstraction that had their own method like current elapsed time, and because they wanted to have monotonic time but with millisecond resolution, well, they did exactly that. They take system nanotime and divide it by the million. And if you have, want to have current wall time, then it's current time. Yes. So they fixed the bug. Everything was worse. It's more or less correct. Hopefully, we also uh, can, uh, can, can use uh, such approach. But then uh, we, go to the, we come to the question, but what is really this current milliseconds? What is really millisecond? Because, OK, what is millisecond? Millisecond is one thousandth part of the second and what exactly the second is. And it turns out that the second is, this is definition from Wikipedia, and as a layman, I read it like, this is like very large number of some radiation, so probably some nuclear waste involved and so on, a super fine level, so probably some scientific blah, blah, blah. So this definition looks pretty scientific, but at school, I've been led that also the other way around, that the uh, Earth resolves around sun and it resolves uh, of its own axis, so one second is like can be computed by dividing a year by by this number, right? So what is the mm, what is the relation of the of those two definitions? And in fact, there are two two definitions of second of millisecond. 
and one gives rise to uh, the UTC time. This is based on atomic clock, which uses these uh, transition periods of cesium atom. And the other one is called UT, which, which gives rise to, for example, GMT time, which is uh, based on how Earth rotates around the sun and around its own axis. So how they two relate, and it's quite amazing that the relation is quite, quite strict, so we can do various things on Earth with Earth, but it still rotates at the same, uh, at the same pace. But it turns out there are some discrepancies. You can see this is, uh, this is the graph of discrepancies between, well, for the last around 45 years. And you can see that the discrepancies rise, 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 and some there's some hope. And what happened? Actually, the union of, of astronomers decided that we need to add one second to uh, UTC time. So th these two definitions are well adjusted because, you know, Earth revolves around the sound at some, uh, with, some, with some variations. So for many, many years, the additions of those sec seconds, con called leap seconds, was where we were problems. We didn't have much computers then. But at 2012, it turned out that there is a problem, right? That our uh, systems and the internet is, uh, well, quite fragile when it comes to, to even so, such uh, small changes in time as one second. So <sighs> currently, there are other ways of adding this leap second. It's not just like the, the clocks are, uh, are stopped for one second or, or they move forward, but they're quite sophisticated algorithms, for example, devised by Google. They're called smearing, which mm, basically amount to the fact that when, when you need to, to adjust the time, the second may be a little, bit, uh, a little bit longer, a little bit shorter, and that's smeared in about, I think, uh, in about, well, 12 hours or 25, uh, 20, 24 hours, right? So you don't, don't have this, this leap, but the time passage is just smaller or later. But how do we actually know where to get this time from, right? At my home, I have this system. It connects to some server and it adjusts the time automatically. When I was younger, you can call also the time teller service and get which time is it. But what about our computers? It turns out, like for, like for the uh, last 40 years, there's quite interesting system or protocol called INTP, which is, well, used exactly for synchronizing clocks. And it's multi-layered. At the top, you have some uh, atomic clocks. And there are different layers of, uh, of nodes that communicate with each other, synchronize time, and so on. So when you, in your computer, you want to use the IT, NTP, you connect to some of the peers in this network, you filter out the outliers, you do some statistic to, to measure and to de average the, all the outputs, and then you adjust time. And you have back pressure, uh, you, you can have some propagation and stuff like that, but at the end you have to adjust time. And again, you probably don't want to adjust it by just setting time like a few seconds uh, faster or slower, you have to do it gradually. So there are other ways in Linux uh, kernel to do that or in Linux libraries. It's called edge time to NTP. And again, it is kind of like more complex because this can affect how clock monotonic uh, behaves. So of course it's monotonic still, but the millisecond can get a little bit faster, a little bit slower and so on. So there's another clock in Unix kernel, it's called clock monotonic row, and it doesn't, uh, it isn't adjusted by, uh, by NTP. And there are some, uh, some considerations that Java shouldn't be possible to use this clock uh, just like that, but fortunately it was closed at one fix, so we don't have to worry too much about it. But if, if you look about um, how this NTP goes, for example, using Crony C daemon, you can see that the uh, the, the re resolution of the synchronization is quite large. It's like 56, 7 milliseconds or something like that. So in bad cases, it can go like 100 milliseconds and so on. So why is it so, uh, so high? This protocol is based on uh, the nodes communication with each other and measuring how, 
how fast the signals are going. And unfortunately, this is unfortunately this is how the today's internet look like. So it's a mess of cables, and in fact, you don't know how how the signal will go. Will go? Will it go from I don't know Serbia to Warsaw via London, via Frankfurt, or via Karachi? So there's quite a lot of statistics to to adjust for, this, for those differences, but still the resolution is not so perfect. Which brings us to another topic. What happens if we have to synchronize the, not only our computer time with, with some you know, common time in the world, but we, when we want to synchronize time on, our, on different machines, when you have distributed system. So for sure we have quite a few clocks or watches then. And what may happen, and what I've learned quite early in my career, is that when you have uh, not synchronized time, time uh, clocks, for example, when uh, the NTP goes wrong or something like that, you can have situation like this. You send a, a message, in my case, that was a long time ago, so it was JMS message, with TTL 30 minutes. You send it at 11, it arrives at 11.40. No, it arrives at the same time, but the server had different, uh, different date set, so the TTL just passed and the message is gone, right? This shouldn't be this way. And this is exactly because our clocks were, weren't synchronized. So in fact, people are starting to thinking about it quite a long time ago. There's a paper by Barbara Liskov. It's the same a person from, from the Liskov principle. So she was really, or is, sorry, uh, quite, quite well known and yeah, and brilliant uh, re researcher. And there are quite a few algorithms that uh, deal with, uh, uh, with clock synchronization and various algorithms that need, that need uh, clocks to be synchronized. And one of, the, one of the, I would say, uh, areas when uh, synchronization is, is really needed is transaction serializability. Right, so if you have one single database on one single computer, you can have transactions going around. They can be concurrent, but if you have proper transaction isolation, like, like mm, snapshot isolation is Postgres or ser serializable, you can pretend that they are not uh, coming concurrently, but just like single threaded. When we have distributed system, it's even more difficult because there's various propagation layers, communication delays, and so on. So it's hard to decide which transaction happened uh, on which node and have some consistent view of the system. It goes more or less to, to, to the problem that we have one transaction here, and afterwards we start different transaction, but if the clocks on the server is, are not connected, judging by, by the time of uh, when the transaction begins, we may have skewed view of the system. So one idea is to wait uh, until enough time passes so we are sure that the clocks are not, uh, are, are, are synchronized and, and the, the order of transaction that we observe uh, from the point of the user is, is the same as uh, the order of transaction judging by the system clocks. But for that algorithm to, to, to be better, uh, to, be, to, to be correct, we need to have a quite good, um, uh, quite good clock synchronization, much, uh, much better than these, like, I don't know, 50, 60 milliseconds provided by NTP. But fortunately, we can sync a little bit better. And Google, quite a few years, introduces their uh, TrueTime API, which not only, uh, which, which doesn't say what time is it exactly, but uh, answers with an interval. For sure, the time is between this and this. So we know we are in certain, uh, in certain uh, error band. We don't know what exactly time it is, but be because we know that up to, I don't know, probably a few milliseconds we know what time it is, we can uh, reason about it. So how Google achieves that? Well, mostly with, uh, with atomic clocks and, uh, and the fact that they are on their fibers, their cables. Fortunately, the atomic clocks do, do not look like this anymore. They can be quite small, 
Actually, I think you can buy such thing in the internet. So here's the coin and here's the atomic clock. And also, you can use different stuff like, for example, GPS to, to track exact time. Right? GPS in our, uh, in our phones are mostly used to determine our, determine our position, but it can go the other way around. When we know the position of the server, we can use GPS to, to, to track the amount of time and to synchronize the clocks. Of course, we can we go to different problems there. For example, this is the amount of computation you have to do to adjust the GPS time because 45 microseconds per day because the satellite is far from the Earth and the gravity works differently. Seven seconds be because it's work, uh, the satellite moves quite fast, and all of this is in the relativity theory. But fortunately, the computations are not so. Uh, difficult, and for example, the Amazon also provides a uh, similar AP API as, uh, as the Google. And sometimes in some, uh, some circumstances, such uh, good clock synchron synchronization is needed even by uh, regulations. For example, here's the, um, here's the project of European reg regulations saying that if you want to do high frequ frequency trading, your clocks have to be synchronized up to I think 100 microseconds, so that's really, really small amount of time. But some time ago, people didn't have GPS, and maybe we also do, don't have them in our server room. Uh, fortunately, uh, for, fortunately uh, the issue of, of uh, ordering uh, of events were studied, again, for quite a considerable amount of time, like for the last 40, 50 years. There's an interesting paper by Leslie Lampert, who introduces the notion of logical clocks which can allow us to introduce some kind of partial or ordering of, of events, even in the uh, absence of some kind of real synchronized clocks. So when the uh, various nodes communicate with each other, there are different, uh, different count uh, there's a counter that is uh, increased with, uh, with, which with, with which message, right? And this, this can give rise to partial ordering of events, but it's, uh, it's, it's not connected with real physical time. So nowadays there are most sophisticated algorithms, one of them is hybrid logical clocks, which include two counters. Well, one is based on real physical time, and the other, kind of like auxiliary, is based on the message passing between different parts of the system. And this is used in many distributed databases like Mongo, Cockroach, and, uh, and stuff like that. But this algorithm is not so, it's not so easy uh, as it may seem. Uh, it's not so easy to, to get right the, uh, diff, uh, the, the properties, the real uh, error boundaries. So in some cases, you can go away with something much more simpler to resolve this problem. Say we have a node, he wants to have exact time. So he asks the time teller, and then the different nodes also ask for direct time, and one piece of the software, one, one node just answers, this is, this, this, this is your time, this is your time, and it, it's his job to make sure that the timestamps received are consistent and they're monotonous and so on. Of course, this is a bottleneck, single point of failure and so on, but such timestamp oracle can also be used to provide you with meanings of synchronizing time in various subsystems. Okay, that was fast, but we did have only 30 minutes, so it's time more or less to wrap up. Uh, I want you to come up with, uh, with, with a few, few obse observations. One is that measuring times is surprisingly complex. It's not just simple current time milliseconds, and there are very nasty uh, dragons inside. The other one is that time passes such is not as regular as you think. It can, be, um, it can be changed not only by us adjusting system time clocks, clock, but also by various means of, uh, of micro adjustments of length of the seconds and stuff like that. And that in certain cases, some algorithms can make up for the lack of, of the synchronization that is not provided by, uh, by the hardware. And of course that you shouldn't have two watches. I don't have any one. And I do hope you enjoyed the talk, and I do hope you will enjoy the rest of the conference. Unfortunately, I don't think we have any time for questions, but 
feel free to approach me and talk to you about it.